In this video, we will be learning all about projectile motion. Let's go skydiving. You have already done the lab investigation for horizontal motion where you pushed the car and found the speed, velocity, and acceleration. However, let's review those terms here now because they will apply to projectile motion as well. Before we talk about specifically speed, velocity, and acceleration, we need to discuss the difference between a scalar quantity and a vector quantity. Scalar quantities refer to something that has magnitude only. For example, how much money you have in your purse or wallet is a scalar amount. It just has an amount. You either have $20 or you have $10 or you have 35 cents. A vector amount would be an amount that um, has both magnitude and amount and a direction like either up or down, left or right, positive or negative. So an example of a vector quantity could be something like your checking account. If you have a checking account, you could have $20 in the in the account or you could be negative $20 and be overdrawn $20 in your account. So that makes it a vector quantity because it has a direction and a number associated with it. So let's talk about speed. Speed is the distance that you travel per unit of time. It is only the distance traveled per unit of time, so it is a scalar quantity because it doesn't matter whether you traveled north or south, east or west, it's just how far you traveled in how long. Velocity is an object's speed and the direction of motion. So velocity is a vector quantity because you can travel 40 miles an hour to the north or you can travel 40 miles an hour to the south. So the velocity will have a positive or negative to indicate a direction as well as a amount to indicate the speed. So velocity is a vector quantity. Acceleration is also a vector quantity. It's the change in velocity over a certain period of time. Your velocity could be increasing, have a positive velocity, or your velocity could be decreasing, slowing down over a certain period of time. So an increasing velocity, a change in velocity would be positive acceleration. A decreasing change in velocity would be negative acceleration. And so we would call that a vector quantity. Gravity tends to pull all objects toward the center of the Earth. So we have a constant for acceleration for, of gravity, which describes the acceleration of any object falling towards the Earth. The standard uh, unit, the international standard unit of measurement for the constant of gravity is negative 9.81 meters per second squared, or meters per second per second. The US customary unit for the gravitation acceleration constant is negative 32 feet per second squared or feet per second per second. Notice that the two constants are negative. This is a vector quantity. The negatives on the 9.81 and the negative 32 represent that your motion is going down or towards the earth. Write these two constants down in your engineering notebook because they are going to be used several times throughout this unit to help you make your calculations. Let's say that we are going to go skydiving. That means we're just going to jump out of a plane and take our chances falling to the ground and arriving at whatever, however long it takes us to get to the earth. Gravity pulls all people towards the Earth at 32 feet per second per second. So each second I go 32 feet per second. So after jumping after one second, then I will have my velocity will be 32 feet per second. After two seconds, I'm traveling 32 feet per second per second, so that after two seconds, that would make my velocity 64 feet per second. After three seconds at 32 feet per second per second, I'm traveling at 96 feet per second. After four seconds, 128 feet per second. 32 times four makes 128. After five seconds, 
160 feet per second per second. After 6 seconds, 192 feet per second per second. This is why when you're skydiving, the closer you get to the ground, the faster you, you are falling because the gravitational constant, gravity, is pulling you towards the earth faster and faster the longer that you are in the air. So that's why we have a parachute that we need to deploy before, hopefully, we hit the ground. What's more daring than skydiving? The human cannonball. The human cannonball is different than skydiving because we have motion in two directions. When you jump from an airplane and you're skydiving, you only have vertical motion. You're falling straight back down towards the center of the earth. When you're shot from a human cannonball, you have a motion in two directions. You're being pushed out in the horizontal direction as well as falling back to the earth in the vertical direction. A projectile is any moving object upon which the only active force is gravity. So anytime you're being launched from something, a slingshot, a human cannonball, um, a projectile launcher, a ballistic device, all of these things are projectiles because after the initial launch, the only force acting upon it is gravity. Gravity pulls all projectiles towards the center of the Earth at the same rate which we've talked about being negative 9.81 meters per second squared or negative 32 feet per second squared. Things that are important whenever we are talking about projectiles. One important part is the firing angle. This is measured in degrees. It's the angle at which the projectile left the cannon or the launcher. Another important uh, term is initial velocity, and that's the angular speed of a projectile at the start of its flight. With what force or what velocity do we launch our projectile? This symbol right here is the Greek letter theta, and we use it to represent angles. You'll see this in your math class as well. Do not try this at home. Human cannonball training is not advised. Let's look at the cannonball when we shoot the cannon at an angle, theta, of 90 degrees. If we were to shoot the guy out of the cannon straight up, this is what would happen. We would have an initial velocity. We're going to shoot him out of the cannon at 128 feet per second. At one per, after one second, we will lose 32 feet per second. That's because the earth is pulling back 32 feet per second per second. So then after two seconds, he's only going 64 feet per second. After three seconds, he's traveling 32 feet per second. And then after four seconds, he's traveling zero feet per second. This is where he reaches his maximum point because now he's no longer moving in the positive direction. He's going to start being pulled. We're still losing 32 feet per second. So now we'll be falling towards the earth 32 feet per second then 64 feet per second, then 96 feet per second, back down to the ground at 128 feet per second. What if we made our angle for the human cannonball to be zero degrees and we shot him straight across? This would assume that he had a constant horizontal velocity, always traveling at the same speed, then he would hit the bullseye. But as we've learned in our PowerPoint, when we turn gravity on, gravity is going to pull us back towards the center of the Earth. So we will not go straight out towards the target. We will end up falling off and going back towards the center of the Earth at 32 feet per second per second. So we have, let's put this motion together. We have the, when the projectile is launched, he is traveling actually in two different directions. He travels in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction, and the combination of these two make him end up appearing to travel in a diagonal direction. 
So write this equation down in your engineering notebook. It's going to be super important. V sub i stands for the initial velocity. If we know how far the projectile is launched and at what angle he is launched, then we can calculate with what velocity he was initially launched using this formula. V sub i stands for the initial velocity. G represents the gravitational acceleration. If you are in international standard units, it's negative 9.81 meters per second squared. If you are in the U.S. customary unit, you, it is negative 32 feet per second squared. X represents the horizontal distance traveled, so how far away in the X direction he landed from where he was launched. And then theta represents the angle at which he was fired. It's really important to note in this equation that your gravitational constant is negative. So when I substitute in my gravitational constant, it is negative. So I will have the opposite of a negative 9.81, which ends up making this number become positive. And that's how we're able to take the square root. Right now, it looks like we're trying to take the square root of a negative number, which from your math classes you may have learned is not possible. We get imaginary numbers. But the reason this works is because our gravitational constant is also negative. So we have two negatives, which switches that over to be a positive. Another caution that you should take when working this formula is to be sure that when you do the sine of the angle, this 2 right here means I need to do twice whatever angle I'm firing. For example, if I shoot this cannonball at an angle of 20 degrees, then my formula would be 2 times 20, so I would do the sine of 40 degrees. After the PowerPoint video, I will be working some sample problems for you so you can see how this all works out mathematically. We can calculate, say that we know the angle at which a projectile is launched and the initial velocity with which we are going to launch him. We can determine how far away he will land by knowing those two variables using this formula on your screen. Please copy this formula into your engineering notebook as it is going to be super helpful to you in the coming assignments. Again, x still represents the horizontal distance traveled from where the cannon where the projectile was launched to where the projectile lands. V sub i stands for the initial velocity and notice that it's being squared. So we're going to take whatever velocity we launch the projectile with and we need to square it. Then again we'll do the sine of 2 times my angle that I launched and we'll divide by the gravitational constant. Again we have the negative for the gravitational constant so that whenever I plug in the negative of the gravitational constant constant, it cancels each other out and becomes positive. We can also know the initial velocity and the landing point, the x direction. Any two of these variables can help me find the third. So I can find the angle with which I should launch something if I know how much velocity I'm going to start uh, use to launch the projectile and I know the distance that I need the projectile to land from where it's launched. Please write this formula down in your engineering notebook because you're going to need this in the coming assignments. Notice this doesn't find the angle. This finds two times the angle. So whenever I use this formula and I plug in all of my values and I solve it, I'm not going to get my angle, I'm going to get twice the angle. So when I solve this right side of the equation and I get an answer of say 60 degrees, the angle at which I should launch the projectile is actually 30. Again, G stands for the gravitational constant, X stands for the distance, the horizontal distance from the launch to the landing. And then V sub I stands for the initial velocity with which I'm going to launch my projectile. These are the formulas that we're going to need in order to solve our projectile and pumpkin chunkin uh, projects to be able to deliver a, a target with some accuracy. So from 
This concludes our PowerPoint presentation, but I will be working some example problems because using these formulas is what's going to make your target practice successful.